And one of the things you should be thankful for is that I'm not preaching this weekend. Because I have tried to do that when I've come back from a 10-hour time zone difference. And I remember one, uh, I, I came back and I was determined. I landed and I came here to preach. Wow, that was stupid. One of the stupidest things I've ever done. And Alan was in the back as he watched me sort of just grind down to a slow whatever it was. And he told me afterwards, I was wondering what in the world are you talking about up there? Because <laughs> it made no sense whatsoever. I have a friend who, who, who flew in somewhere to preach, and he was terribly jet-lagged, and he closed his eyes to pray, and that was the last thing he remembered. He fell asleep in the pulpit. That hasn't happened. But um, I'm excited that you get to, uh, to uh, hear this, uh, this young man who's going to be preaching the Word today. I, I get to travel a little bit and visit other churches, and if you're ever in Monterey, up that way, uh, visit Calvary Chapel of Monterey, and Nate Holdridge is the pastor there. We p visited there a couple of times, and uh, probably for the first time I went there, I, I said, Nate, next time that you've got an opening, would love to have you come down and preach in, in Huntington Beach. And I started my nagging, begging, whining, whatever it took. And I was so thankful when I got the call from him before I left, a little while before I left. He said, I'm, hey, I'm going to be down in, in Southern California over this time, and if you'd like me to speak that weekend, he said, I, I would, I'd be happy to do that. And it was this weekend, so you don't have to watch your pastor fall asleep today. Hmm. And what, uh, I've, I've heard this message twice. I'm going to roam around and visit your kids in the uh, children's ministry area. This one, I'll be back in to hear it again for the last service as I sit with joy. But uh, you, you're going to have a, a trip through the best song ever written. Everybody say that. The best song ever written. Now say it like a hipster. The best song ever written, okay? Ever written. And it really is. Psalm 23. So would you guys welcome Nate Holdridge? And his daughter, June, is right here too. So welcome. Welcome to Refuge, brother. So good to Thank have you. you. Here. Good morning, Refuge. So great to see you. It's a real dream of mine to be able to be with you and have heard so much about this church and of course have known Bill and Joy for a few years now and have watched from afar at some of the things God is doing here and it's just been kind of a bucket list thing for me. I gotta go hang out with my refuge. I love how you guys call it the refuge family. Gotta go hang out with family for a weekend. So happy Thanksgiving family. It's coming up this Thursday. Let's turn to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. And as you're turning there just to tiny bit about me just to give you some get your sea legs under you before we get into the word today uh, I grew up in a pastor's home uh, believed in the Lord at an early age in my life walked away from the Lord during my teenage years came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit during a seven-month period of time while I was 18 years old the summer of 1996 the Holy Spirit broke me down I gave my life to Christ began to walk with him four months later I heard the voice of the Lord say I've not called you to these other things you've planned on I've called you to teach my word and I've dedicated my life to the study of God's word the communication of God's word since uh, that day I've been serving the church that I'm in Calvary Monterey for get this man I'm so excited about this because at the end of December it will be 20 full years that I've been able to be with this church. Yeah, I rejoice at that. Eleven of those years as the lead senior pastor. And God is just doing great things there in Monterey. We're up against it. You know, just as you are here, there's so many people that do not know the Lord, so many people against the Lord who need to hear the gospel. So we're just trying to share the love of Christ with our community and continue to bless and, and minister the Word of God uh, where we live and where we serve. I've been married to my wife, Christina, who we met in our home church for 17 years. We have three daughters together. One is 15, one is almost 13, and one is 11 years old. So I covet your prayers. <laughs> but uh, we, ha we have got a great thing going, love our family, love my girls. And I came down here to Southern California to do a few different ministry things. Uh, at the beginning of the week, I couldn't really have a travel buddy. I was doing some things with some other pastors down in, uh, down in the Marietta area. But on Thursday, once that was finished with, my daughter June flew down and we've been hanging out 
all weekend together doing different things, doing different ministry things. But we also, we got to go to Knott's Berry Farm on Friday. I haven't been there since I was a little boy. There was nobody there, you know. It was just totally empty. We got on every ride, you know, real quick. It was their first night of their Christmas decoration. So I, I was kept texting my wife. I'm like, Merry Christmas, babe. I love it. it is Christmas time. And uh, we got to watch Snoopy, you know, sk- doing the ice skating thing. That was just so fun. So it's just a joy being here with you. But Psalm 23 is our text for the day. Real blessed psalm, like Pastor Bill said. Probably the most famous song uh, in all of human history, if you really think about it. So what I'd like to do is, is read the whole song in its entirety, pray, and then jump into it. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You, verse 5, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of of the Lord forever. Father, we come to you this morning thankful that you sent your only begotten Son who could become the good shepherd over our souls. And we invite your shepherding work into our lives today. We, the sheep of your pasture. We ask, Lord, that as we walk out of here today, that we would have a deepened appreciation, thankfulness, and love for your role in nurturing and shepherding and bringing us along in life. Teach us, Lord, today by your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would do this, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray together. Amen. Amen. The psalm has two main characters. Character number one is the Lord, the shepherd Lord. David says the Lord is is my shepherd. And if you remember, David knew a thing or two about sheep and about shepherding. Before he had become the anointed of the Lord, before he had become the son-in-law to the king in Israel, before he had become the best friend of the prince in Israel, before he had become a fugitive running from that father-in-law, before he had become the king over Judah, before he had become the king over all of Israel, Before any of that in David's life, before he wrote a psalm to the Lord, David had cared as a teenager, as a young man, for his father Jesse's sheep. And out in the wilderness, as he protected the sheep, as he defended the sheep, as he nourished the sheep, as he, at times when they needed medical attention, healed the sheep, David, over the years, began to discover what I am doing for these sheep, the things I'm providing for these sheep, the Lord provides for his people. He realized, this first character, the Lord is a shepherd. But the second character is David himself. He didn't say, actually, the Lord is a shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. So the second character is David the sheep. Or if you want to personalize it yourself, you'd say the main characters are the shepherd Lord and the sheep me, or the sheep you. Now David, of course, was an important man. If you think about it, during his lifetime, David was the most important man alive. The most important person walking on the face of the earth. He was the king in Israel, of course, the anointed of the Lord, but there also came a point in David's life where God promised to him through the prophet Nathan that 
One day, through David's offspring, the Messiah, Savior, who would save the world from their sins, would be born. So within his DNA was the future Christ. And so in a sense, you could say David was far and away the most important person walking on the face of the earth. Yet this man, in all of his grandiosity, in all of his importance, had come to a place in his life where he was able to say, the Lord is not just a shepherd who takes care of some of his people, but the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is watching over me. The Lord has defended me. The Lord has protected me. The Lord has preserved me. The Lord has nourished me. And I love that from David because, well, the reality is this is a humble spirit that he has before the Lord. Listen, I don't know you personally. I don't know your situation and I don't know your life, but I'm sure there's some very important people that are here in the room today. I'm sure there are some big shot people that tomorrow when you walk the halls of wherever, there are going to be people going, oh, you know who that is, you know, kind of thing. But you've got nothing on David, the king of Israel, the father, if you will, of our Messiah who was referred to as the son of David. And David, in all of his importance, was able to come to a place in his life to say, and I need God as my shepherd. Can you? Can you come to that place in your heart? Can you say, the Lord is my shepherd? I'm just a sheep before my Lord. I almost imagine David going through a process in his life where once he became the king in Israel, he started watching the Israelites and started saying to himself, you know, they behave so similarly to my father's sheep. And I'm going to help God with this whole shepherding thing. And then one day waking up and saying, You know, I also behave like a sheep. I also need the Lord in his direction. So those are the first two characters. The shepherd Lord and the sheep David, or the sheep you, the sheep me. There's a promise, though, in this psalm. It's also found there in verse 1 after the first two characters are mentioned. The Lord is my shepherd. Here's the promise. I shall not want. To me, this is an incredible description, an incredible proclamation, an incredible confession to be able to actually say, look, in my life, I'll tell you what, I have no wants. I am completely satisfied. I am totally satiated. I am absolutely, completely Full. Some of you are going to say this in a very literal kind of sense by Thursday afternoon or Thursday evening. You're going to say, I have no wants. Hey, have another piece of pie. No, I couldn't possibly do it. I have no wants. I am totally full. I am completely and absolutely satisfied. Now, wouldn't you love to be able to say this? Wouldn't you love to be able to say in life, I, I, you know, I'm good. I'm complete. I'm satiated i'm satisfied i am filled to the brim there is absolutely nothing that i need there is nothing that i want i mean this i don't i don't don't want to say it or state it lightly as if this is just something that every christian just automatically possesses and has i'm sure many of us got up this morning you maybe even drove to church today thinking to yourself you know i i want this and i want that you know, Christmas is coming, man, my kids are really good. They get that Christmas list going, things that they want. As much as we try to tell them it's all about Jesus, they're definitely thinking about those presents. And I'm not going to act like I'm all spiritual either. I got my own little Christmas list going. I want this camping thing. I want this stove. You know, I want all this stuff, you know, kind of thing. I'm thinking about stuff like that. But David, he was at a place in his life where he said, you know, with the Lord as my shepherd, I'm in this place of contentment satisfaction we talk as christians about what it means to be free we sang about it earlier free i'm free to me this person this person that says i shall not want i have no wants i'm totally satisfied that is a person who is free they are unencumbered they're not pulled by the desires of this life but they are satisfied within themselves in god 
They have no want. They are a free individual. Paul the Apostle actually strikes me as that kind of person. I don't know if you know this, but the book of Philippians, our little letter in the New Testament that we have, it was a letter that Paul the Apostle wrote to a church in a city called Philippi. It it was not a letter filled with correction. There was nothing to correct them about. It was not even really a letter filled with lots of teaching or instruction, even though it has it inside of the letter, because Paul didn't set out to teach them or correct them about some erroneous doctrine. It was actually a letter that Paul wrote to thank them, to thank them for their financial generosity because he was their missionary and they had supported him and they had previously, right around that time, sent him a financial gift. And so he sat down and under the inspiration of the Spirit, he wrote to them a letter to thank them for what they had given to him. And in the close of his letter, Paul wrote these words. Let me read them to you. Philippians 4, verse 11, he says, Look, I'm not speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul had learned, he said, the secret of contentment. I remember years ago when I was a teenager, how many of you are familiar with that ministry, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes? It was on our church campus. It was kind of this thing where athletes would get together, they'd study the Bible, and so you know, they would kind of talk with me from time to time. And someone gave me a Fellowship of Christian Athletes Bible. And in in this Fellowship of Christian Athletes Bible, they had certain verses like highlighted and pulled out, you know, and stuff like that. And I remember one time I was sitting there getting ready, you know, we're kind of waiting for, uh, to go change and all that before a basketball game that I was playing in. And and I remember I I pulled out this Bible and I was kind of flipping through it and I found Philippians 4, 13. They had it all, you know, highlighted and, and all that. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and I was looking at that verse and I was like oh Lord okay well God if if you're really up there then today I pray that you would give me the strength to score a triple double I want 20 points 10 rebounds and 10 assists you know hook me up I want to get my name in the paper today you know kind of thing and uh, it didn't happen (laughs) <laughs> it didn't happen. And I, di- and I discovered years later that when Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, he wasn't talking about being able to dunk a basketball or do these things that we might want to do. What he was saying was, and I learned the secret of contentment. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. I can do all of it. I can do any of it through Christ who strengthens me. David had come to a similar place in his life. The Lord, as my shepherd, brings me to a place where I have no need, I have no desire, I am completely satisfied. How many of you today, you'd say, I want to get there. I want to get to that place. I want to come to that place deeper and deeper of being able to say, I shall not want. Well, if that's the case, then... I've got good news for you because we're going to climb through this psalm now. And what I'm going to do, I don't want to scare you with this, but I'm I'm going to take you through eight different things a shepherd does to bring us to a state of contentedness in him, all from this song. So if you're a note taker, you're going to want to write these eight things down. The first one is really simple. He brings us to a place of contentedness by, number one, making us lie down. Look at that in verse two. He says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, when I had younger children and I would read this verse, making me lie down in green pastures, I would think about the difficult work that a parent has to do to get their children to go to sleep at night. You know, it's just like, oh man, I will pay you a million (laughs) dollars if you will just go to sleep. And there were times where I would literally make them lie down. You you don't need to call Child Protective Services on me or anything like that. It wasn't abusive, but there were times where they're in their crib and you could tell they want to get up, they want to hang out, and I kind of put my hand down and I kind of rub their backs and that rub would turn into a little like firm, (laughs) 
stay there. Please just go to sleep. Relax your body. Go to sleep, you know, kind of thing. And we might think of that when we read this. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures like the Lord comes along to his sheep and just says, stay, stop, rest. But that's not what's happening in this passage. What's happening here is that the shepherd is doing as much work as he can to bring his sheep, or the Lord is doing as much work as he can to bring his people into a place of Sabbath rest before him. There's a man, a pastor named Philip Keller, who used to be a shepherd, and he wrote a book about Psalm 23. And in his, in his book, he said this, he said, the strange thing about sheep is that because of their very makeup, it is almost impossible for them to be made to lie down unless four requirements are met. In other words, they're just kind of a stressed out creature. They can't rest unless these four things are taken care of. He said, number one, they have to be free of a fear of all predators. You know, as long as they think there's a mountain lion cruising around or a wolf cruising around, they, have, they, they just can't rest. So the shepherd has to kind of show them you're safe. Number two, they have to be free from friction with other sheep. I just sort of imagine this, like little, you know, like clicks of sheep, you know, like we don't like you guys, you know, kind of thing. And and the shepherd working hard to bring peace amongst the flock. Number three, they have to be free from torment from pests. So fleas or bugs that are getting into their eyes, the shepherd medicates them and helps them to be free of that torment. And number four, they have to be free of hunger, a desire for food. Their their bellies have to be full. Sounds like a lot of guys I know, you know, as long as I got a full belly, I'm good to go, you know, kind of thing. (laughs) Here, what we learn is that the shepherd, our Lord, our good shepherd, he is working hard to bring us into that security, to bring us into that peace with others to bring us into that lack of torment, to satisfy our souls, He is working hard to bring us into that place where we can lie down, where we can rest before Him. Look, this life, it's not an easy life. Paul said to the people in, I think it was Pisidia, he said, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. I mean, this is a, this is a painful, painful world that we are living in. However, there's this dichotomy for the christian because we learn in hebrews chapter 4 that there remains here in this life a sabbath rest for the people of god somehow we go through the tribulations we go through the pain we go through the difficulty but there can be simultaneous to that a rest within the soul think of your shepherd working hard to bring you into that place of rest now number two The shepherd brings us to a state of contentedness by number two, satisfying our thirst. Satisfying our thirst. He says in verse two, he leads me beside still waters. He leads me beside still waters. Now they say that one of the things about sheep is that they don't like moving water, rushing water. And you know, For us, from our vantage point, we understand that it's moving water that is actually the healthiest kind of water. I'm an outdoorsy kind of person, and I like going on long outdoor adventures, sometimes as a runner, sometimes as a backpacker, and, and sometimes you go on adventures where you could not possibly carry enough water to last you during the whole trip. And so you figure out where there's going to be points where there's a water source, some kind of river or stream that is clean enough to, with a water filtration system, be able to drink from. And when you come to that place, you don't go and find like the green funky kind of water you find the water that's moving you you kind of realize like okay that's a little healthier that's what i want to be drinking from but sheep apparently are not like that the water that's moving scares them so so often they'll go to the stuff that is stagnant or parasitic yet still and they'll go to that water so a shepherd in that era would often go ahead of his sheep find the rushing water take a bunch of stones and rocks and go out into the stream 
and create a little thing to where the water would move into it, yet be still enough, fresh water that has been stilled for his sheep to be able to drink. The Lord wants to bring us to the still waters. You see, human beings have a tendency to try to slake their thirst, quench their desires with waters, with sources that are harmful to them. God said through the prophet Jeremiah, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, number one, the fountain of living waters, and then number two, they have hewn out for themselves cisterns which are cracked and broken and cannot even hold water. The idea was God is there. The image is that he is like this fountain, this continual flow of pure and good and lovely water that can satisfy a man or a woman, but that his people were turning from him and actually carving out of the rock. This would be like a way to catch rain water. It would be an, a, a kind of water that was not as desirable as the rushing water, but those cisterns, God says, they're not even effective. They're cracked and broken cisterns that can hold no water. And so often we turn to this or that to satisfy our thirst when the Lord is there. The Lord is present. Jesus shared this kind of concept in the Gospel of John. You might remember the story. There was a moment John wrote where Jesus had to go through Samaria. And he went to a well in Samaria at the, in the middle of the day at noon and sent his disciples away to go and get some food in town. And there in the heat of the day, a woman came out, a Samaritan woman. She was probably an outcast, even in her own society. And that's probably why she was there, not during the cool of the day when most people would come to get water, but in the heat of the day, just sort of thinking, no one will see me. I can kind of sneak in and sneak out. But Jesus was there. And he began to converse with her. She was surprised by this because he was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. He was a man. She was a woman. He was a rabbi. She was not. And in that culture, those people did not intermix. But he began to speak to her. He asked for a drink of water. She wondered, how is it that you, a Jew, are speaking to me? And then he responded to her and he said, if you knew who it was who asked you for a drink of water, you would ask him for water. And he would quench your thirst and out of your heart would flow rivers of living water. Now, she obviously did not know what Jesus was talking about. Don't hate on her for that. Imagine yourself being there 2,000 years ago and some guy says to you, if you knew who it was who asked of you water, you would ask him for water and out of your heart would flow rivers of living water. I doubt any of us 2,000 years ago would go, oh, you're the Messiah. <laughs> she had no idea. So Jesus had to illustrate his point. He then said to her, call your husband bring him here she said i have no husband jesus then said to her it's right that you said you have no husband for you've had five husbands and the man you're living with today you are not even married to when jesus said that to her he was not saying it to her to decimate her he was not saying it to her to embarrass her or to shame her no he had been talking to her about the thirst of her spirit and that she had been turning to the wrong sources to quench her thirst and he needed her to see where she had repeatedly been going to try to quench her thirst so that she could understand that what she was looking for could be found in him. If you or I were there that day, I wonder what thing Jesus would have told us to go and get. Go and get your remote control. Well, Lord, I don't have a remote control. You're right when you say you don't have a remote control because you have 20, you know, or something like that. You know, just wh whatever it might be that, that we would turn to to try to find satisfaction in life. The Lord, He wants to work hard to be the one to satisfy the longing of our spirit. Number three, 
the good shepherd brings us to a place of contentedness by setting our soul aright. Number three, setting our soul aright. Look at it there in verse three. He says, he restores my soul. Now, now this is a real shocker for me as I'm going through it because, I mean, at this point, I'm all in on the shepherd sheep analogy. You got the shepherd, he's bringing his sheep to green pastures, they're lying down, they're sleeping under the stars, you know, you've got the still waters, you know, I'm just in this whole thing. And then all of a sudden he comes in, he's talking about sheep and shepherds, and then he says, and he restores my soul. It's just kind of like a shock to my system to think about this little sheep who's like got some like soul problems. You know, I just imagine like a sheep lying down on his therapist's couch, you know, just like, and then this other sheep said to me, and it really hurt me, you know, or just whatever it is, you know, it's like, what, what's going on here? And, and then also, what's happening with a, with a sheep under this shepherd's care actually coming to a place in their life where they are, they are in need of soul restoration? You see, David understood that there would be times where even under the Lord's watch, he would go through personally agitation or frustration or anger or disappointment or hurt or depression. Sometimes we come up in church and it's like, how's it going? It's good. It's all good. When really we've been carrying around some hurt or depression, or disillusionment, or disappointment in our hearts, in our lives. David is able to confess, look, even with the Lord as my shepherd, there are times where my soul gets out of whack, where my insides become imbalanced, where the inner me, the true me, is not where it should be, yet the Lord, my shepherd, he works so hard to restore my soul to bring me back into that place where my soul is aright. My soul is where it needs to be. If you think about David's life, man, he went through so many real serious ups and downs in life. And so many of the downs that he went through occurred within his spirit. It's part of the reason that he wrote such beautiful songs, why he was able to write half, at least, of the songbook of Israel, the book of Psalms. Because he went through such pain, he went through such agony, his heart felt his humanness in such a potent kind of way. And we're very thankful for that. I mean, who wants to read a bunch of songs by somebody who never struggled a day in their life? You know, like, let me write you another song about how magical my life has been. I mean, it would just be so depressing. We're, just, we're so weird. You know, we get so encouraged. Like, oh, David struggled. I'm encouraged by that. But God would minister to David's soul. You know, the Lord, he is that shepherd who wants to and is constantly working to bring your soul back into that place of uprightness. Think of Peter. Think of this man who was so confident in himself. He said, Lord, even if all of them deny you, I will not deny you. And Jesus said, before the rooster crows this morning, the second time, you will have denied me three times. And before a little fire out in the courtyard of the high priest, Peter swore that he did not know Jesus to people who in that culture were not the bigwigs. It was a slave girl and some servants. He could not even stand up to them and say, I know Jesus. He had failed the Lord. I'm not going to take a show of hands, but how many of you know? And it hurts to fail the Lord. It's painful when you fail the Lord. Jesus looked at him when that rooster crowed and Peter went out and wept. And when Jesus rose from the dead, the angels appeared to the women and said, go tell the disciples and Peter to meet them in Galilee. Peter is not excluded. Jesus met personally with Peter. And then one day, Peter, after seeing Jesus risen from the dead a few different times, went out to the Sea of Galilee to go fishing with some other disciples. And Jesus walked on the shore 
in the early morning hours. They did not recognize him. They'd caught nothing. He shouted out, what have you caught? How have you caught today? They said, we've caught nothing. And he said, then cast your nets on the other side. And for some reason, they did so. And after they did, they brought in a huge haul of fish and they recognized that that was Jesus. It was very similar to a previous episode in their lives. And they said, it's the Lord. And Peter jumped into the lake and swam to the shore. And there was Jesus by a fire, just like where Peter had denied the Lord those three times. And he asked Peter three times, do you love me? Peter said three times in a lesser way, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said three times to him, then feed my sheep tend my lambs, tend my sheep. This was Jesus' way of restoring Peter's soul. And the Lord loves you. He wants to restore your soul. He works so hard to bring you back into that place of hell. Number four, the Lord brings us to that place of contentedness by number four, forging new right paths for us. New right paths for us for us notice it there in verse 3 he says he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake now apparently one of the things about sheep is that sheep will often traverse the same trail until that trail becomes a rut they'll feed on the same ground until their presence there including all of their feces just destroys the ground that they are actually living on. Philip Keller, who I quoted earlier, he said it this way. He said, sheep are notorious creatures of habit. If left to themselves, they'll follow the same trails until they become ruts, graze the same hills until they turn to desert waste, pollute their own ground until it's corrupt with disease and parasites. Many of the world's finest sheep ranges have been ruined beyond repair by overgrazing, poor management, and indifferent or ignorant sheep owners. And just like sheep, human beings will often follow the same patterns over and over and over again, even if those patterns are detrimental to our health. Now, when we think of this, it might be easy for us. I know it's easy for me. When I think about that, oh, the way human beings are, getting in a rut, doing something over and over again, even if it's hurting us, it's very easy for us, I think, to think of other sheep that are like that. <laughs> and not think to ourselves, you know, there might be something in my life where I've gotten into a, a groove that is not a groove, it's a rut. There are paths, though, that the Lord has that are unfamiliar, that seem scary at first glance, but they are good, new, righteous paths that the Lord has for us. You know, my 20 years there in Monterey, you know, it's in a sense, it's it's I'm I'm doing the same thing. I'm waking up in the same place and all of that, but Over and over again, the Lord has put a new wrinkle of obedience in front of my life and said, will you take this path? Sometimes I've said yes, many times I've said no, but every time I've said yes to the Lord, there has been something healthy and beautiful and enriching in store for me there. Right now, one of our pastors there in Monterey, he had on his heart that he wanted to teach uh, to the people in our church. We have a lot of new believers, a lot of younger believers. He wanted to uh, teach a class about finances. He's just real good with money. It's a real passion of his, and he just knows that's a real big trial for a lot of people. So he said, I want to teach a financial class. And so he took sign-ups, got this huge turnout, and all these you know, younger believers, you know, they're just kind of getting started out in their walk with Christ. And I love asking him, like, hey, man, how did it go the week that you started unpacking to them the idea of being a generous person who gives their money away? You know, because I just love, like, what was their reaction like, you know? Because it's like you come to Christ, you're like, man, Jesus loves me unconditionally. I'm covered by the blood. And then someone's like, hey, let me tell you this, like, about tithing. And you're like, what? What? I did not know that that was part of the deal at all. And what does it look like? A scary path. I've never gone that way. I've never done that thing. I've never been that kind of person. But those who have walked that path are able to say, the Lord provides, 
the Lord breaks your, your, your greed within your heart, helps kill that idol. You get to see him miraculously take care of you and all of your needs. You get outside of yourself and you rejoice. Man, what path might there be that the Lord puts in front of you? What person is the Lord saying, I want you to disciple them? It's, it's scary to you to think of, of doing that, but it's a new and righteous path. What ministry? What career shift? What thing might the Lord be saying in front of you, hey, I know this is scary to you, but I have a new and good path for you to take. He leads us into those new and right paths. Number five, the shepherd brings us to a place of contentedness by leading us through the valleys. This is one of the most beautiful parts of the song. He says in verse four, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Now David, he, as I mentioned earlier, he did go through many valleys in life. I mean, he had times where his father-in-law tried to kill him over a dozen times. And sometimes we read these things in David's life like it's a comic book, you know, like, oh, you know, there's this big, huge giant. But, 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 but death was a very real possibility for this man at many different junctures in his life, all the way till the end of his days, there were threats upon his life. And David was able to say, Lord, you know, when I've gone through that valley of the shadow of death, you, you were with me in those moments. Now, ancient shepherds are not like modern-day Western shepherds in the sense that usually in our era, a, a, a rancher will have a specific plot of ground or earth, set up the barbed wire, and that's where his stock will remain. But in those days, shepherds had free range and they would drive their sheep at different times of the year during inclement weather to other locations where they'd be safer and could eat during those difficult months. And to drive them to that place required sometimes that they would go through valleys and go through terrain that was difficult, different from what they were normally used to. And during those seasons where they were driving through some valley or some ravine or some difficult terrain, the sheep's relationship with the shepherd would shift in a pretty significant way. You see out there on the ranch or on the plain, the shepherd could look out upon his sheep. He could kind of roam amongst the flock and tend to individual needs and generally lead them and guide them. But when they're going through a ravine or something like that, there'd be times where they come to a big boulder, the sheep can't get over it, and the, the shepherd's there, and he's just kind of picking each one up, you know, and helping them get over. They're, they're up against the edge of a precipice, and the, sh the shepherd is there watching over them, comforting them. That's why when the song comes to this part, David, who has previously in the song been speaking about God, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. He's talking about God here in this portion, in the valley of the shadow of death, he talks to God. He says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. How many of you would confess that it's been in the trials of life that you have gotten very personal with the Lord? It's been in the trials of life that you have ceased to theorize about God and you've actually experienced God. It's been in the pains of life that your relationship with your shepherd grew closer than before. I'm sure you've got that season in your mind. And we've all gone through plenty of trials. I can think of plenty of trials, big and small. But for me, probably the, the, the big one was a two-year stretch, 2005 to 2006. And I won't get into the details of it, but it was just a very disillusioning kind of time for me in ministry because our church was imploding and the leadership was behaving in a very ungodly kind of way. And as I watched all of this unfold as a younger pastor, it was very jarring for me. My family was kind of falling apart, not my own personal family, but extended family, and, and things were just happening left and right, and I didn't know who to turn to anymore. I found myself turning to the Lord. 
during those sleepless nights, during that anxiety where I could not rest, I'd go out and I'd walk with the Lord under the moonlight. Just cry out to Him, talk to Him. And I began to discover this God who I said was good at all times. I was beginning to experience His goodness during a painful time in life. The shepherd, he brings us to that contentedness by leading us through the valley. Number six, the shepherd brings us to a place of contentedness by number six, skillfully defending us. This comes from verse four where he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The the rod and the staff were weapons of the shepherd and I don't want to belabor this point, so I'll just ask you a question. What would you do if you believed that God would protect you? What would you do if you believed that God would protect you? Every once in a while in my journal, I write that question down. What would I do if I really believed God right now? What would I do in this situation if I really trusted, not myself, but trusted the Lord? Number seven, the shepherd brings us to a place of contentedness by bringing us to the life he's prepared for us. I want you to see this here in verse 5. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now when I'm reading through this song, I kind of think to myself, okay, so we've left sheep land. You know, we're in like shepherd sheep zone, and then all of a sudden we get to this part, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I think about David with a big table, a big turkey, he's got a crown on his head, you know, he's just kind of hanging out, and it's like, the Lord did that for him, you know, kind of thing. But, but I think, actually, we're still in the sheep-shepherd analogy. Think about it like this. In ancient days, like I said, the shepherd would take his sheep away during the inclement weather. And what he would do quite often is find a mesa or a tableland that was h- higher in elevation, which would be a good place for his sheep to go. The shepherd would, a lot of times, I've read, six months ahead of time, go and prepare that place. He'd scout it out, and then a few weeks earlier, scatter a bunch of minerals onto the ground to, to, to prepare it for the coming of his sheep. Now, the sheep have no idea where they're going. They have no idea what the shepherd's prepared for them, but he has gone to prepare a table for them in the presence of their enemy. Now, this is so like the Lord. This is like the Lord in the sense that He is preparing heaven for us, amen? As His people, he, He says to His disciples, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. So He's preparing for us. But what else is the Lord preparing for us here in this life? Let me share one thing that I know the Lord is preparing for every single believer in this room. It says in Romans 8, verse 29, that we as believers are predestined by God to be conformed into the image of God's Son. One of the table lands that the Lord has for you is increased Christ-likeness. If you're married today, look at your spouse today. Say, increased Christ-likeness. That's God's destiny for you. That's what He wants to do in your life. I can't wait for it to happen. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. That's what the Lord wants to do. Now, He says that, Paul. He wrote that right after Romans 8, 28, where he says that for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, he works all things together for good. So often we think the good that God wants to produce is, is, you know, if if I had a fiance and I lost my fiance, God has a better fiance. If I had a house and I lost my house, God has a better house. And sometimes that's what the Lord does, but that's not what that verse is promising. What the verse is saying is that God is using the all things of life in you and in me to help produce that good of Christ-likeness within us. That He has decided that our future is going to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. That's one of the tables the Lord has prepared for you and for me as His sheep. We don't know how He's doing it. We don't know what he's using to do it, but we are being brought by our shepherd to that place. All right, last thing, number eight, 
The shepherd brings us to a place of contentedness by helping us endure life's annoyances. He says in verse 5, you anoint my head with oil. When the sheep up there on the mesa would have uh, the bugs in their face or, or whatever, the shepherd would medicate them with this oil. And he says, look, even when things are annoying in life, you help me endure those annoyances. David's conclusion to all of this is real simple. Let's read it again. Verse 5, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David simply felt, I am a most privileged person to have the Lord as my shepherd. And my prayer in coming down here today is that you would walk away today saying, I am a most privileged person to have the Lord as my shepherd so that he can bring me to that place of contentedness in life. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for the thing that you do in bringing us to that place of gladness and joy and contentedness in Christ. We pray and ask, Lord, that as our shepherd, we would simply, Lord, receive from you. And I pray, Father, for this church, that your hand of deep blessing would be upon them and upon their leadership for the glory of God and the furtherance of the kingdom. We thank you, Lord, and praise you. In Jesus' name, we rejoice together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Goodbye. Yeah? Was that good? I mean, found 10 things to take home. Let's stand together and uh, get ready to take those things home. Um, I can't say, I've, I've talked, taught through Psalm 23 so many times, but that was so fresh for me to hear again from that perspective. Thank you, Nate. And thank you, June, for coming with your dad. It's so good to have you here at Refuge, too. <laughs> I almost had you come up here to introduce your father to us. That would have been fun. But uh, well, while he's talking through that, and, and, and you know, as Nate uh, introduced it, you know, here's a, here's a shepherd. One day realizing, God, you're the shepherd, and what a great shepherd you are. The crazy thought hit me, I'm really glad David was not a plumber. That would have been a very, very different study, wouldn't it? But he'd, he would have found a way to, uh, to apply it. But, uh, so are you, are you grateful that, that God is your shepherd? Are you more confident now as you walk out of here to, to just rest in Him and let Him quench that thirst? And some of you probably have been in a group this size, there has to be some of you that have been drinking the nasty water of the world that just doesn't refresh. It just will not refresh. And you need to allow Jesus now to, to, to give you. He, he's offering to you that living water that gives you life. And if you want that this morning, there'll be a prayer team up here that would love to, to pray with you. But before we go, we're going to sing what we've just learned, okay? So let's sing from Psalm 23. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We'll see you next week. God bless you. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.